Thank you for tuning into Tag Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We pray that this message will truly be a blessing to you today. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so by visiting us at www.tagchurch.net. Also, if you have any prayer requests, please don't hesitate to send them to the email request on your screen. We would love to partner with you in prayer. Now, I hope you are ready for a word from the Lord today. Let's get right into it, and God bless you. How many of you watched the game last night? I'll move on then. Until I can preach to a bunch of people that could care less about basketball. How many of you went to Tim Hawkins last night? I know some of us in here. Uh huh, that's where you were. How many of you were at Tim Hawkins and watching the game at the same time, Terry Wilson? Amen. Oh, Haven Maynard, okay. We're not pointing fingers. We're, just, you know, we'll just move on, move on. Amen. Well, if you, don't, if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, you didn't miss anything. Arkansas missed their chance again. But guess what? They made it to the Elite Eight again. So, woo pig suey, right? Woo pig suey. I'm more of a football fan myself, you know. Okay, I've got some football fans in the house I hear. Okay. But you know the most violent game that I've ever played wasn't football, and the most violent game that I've ever played, it wasn't uh, it wasn't hockey, even though hockey can become a very violent game. The most violent game I think I've ever played in my life is the game called Musical Chairs. <laughs> Has anybody in this room ever played Musical Chairs? Of course you have. Everybody's played Musical Chairs. The thing about Musical Chairs, if you remember playing it as a kid, there was, there was no prize you know, up for grabs, there was no title, you know, there's no musical chair world champion, there's not musical chairs, you know, uh, in, in any kind of sport division, you didn't play it to win anything, really you just played it, it was just for a good dose of competition. Are there any competitors that I'm preaching to in the room this morning? When you play, you want to win. Come on, where are you at today? Yeah, I know where you're at. Amen. I don't like playing games with people that will let other people win. My mom is one of them. We have this game. What's that marble game called? Wahoo. I don't know what y'all call it. Wahoo is what we call it. And, you know, you can take people out. you got to get all your marbles around the board and get them to home. And if you land on someone else's marble, you can take them out. My mom, she'll pick a different marble to move so she doesn't take out one of her kids because she's too nice. I don't like playing with nice people. I want you to take me out when we're playing a game. And I've played some musical chairs where, man, there's only, there, you know, there, there's 10 chairs and there's 11 people playing. Somebody is not going to get a chair, and it can become very, very competitive. And I've seen people get hurt. You know another game that I've seen, and this is totally off topic. It's not a new sermon title. You see the sermon title I'm preaching this morning on musical chairs. But has anybody played that game called Spoons? I love this church. None of you care about basketball. I'm like, how many of you watch basketball? Three people's like. I ask how many of you play spoons. Yeah. Now, if you've never played spoons, you've not started living life. I have a scar right here between my thumb and my pointer finger where a fingernail went into my hand when grabbing for a spoon. But I've seen musical chairs result in people getting hurt. You know, I just had the guys bring out 10 chairs because I thought maybe there might be a few people in this room that would like to play a game of musical chairs. Anybody want to play a game of musical chairs? All right. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to make this fair. I've got 10 chairs, so what does that mean? I guess that means we start with 
11 people, right? So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to find us 11 people, but I'm going to, I'm going to need, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it fair this morning. So I want to start with age bracket of 70. If you are over 70, sorry kids, sit down. If you are over 70, not seven, 70 years old, and you would like to play musical chairs this morning, I need you to raise your hand this morning. If you don't raise it, I will come and get you. Amen. Thank you, Joe Hastings, for uh, volunteering. Give it up for Joe this morning. He's going to come and just go ahead and find you a chair this morning. I need somebody between, are you over 70? Okay, all right, amen. I need somebody between the age of 60 and 70. You're above 60, under 70. Where are you at today? Is that you? Give it up for Pastor Dennis. He's got him a chair today, okay? I need somebody in the 50 age bracket. Where are you at? All right, Gina, we need a lady this morning. Sorry, Paula, sit down, sit down. Give it up for Gina as she comes to participate this morning. All right. I need somebody in the 40 age bracket. Aaron, all right, I see that hand. Amen. Come on down. The 40 age bracket. How about somebody in their 30s? I don't know if we're at church this morning or if we came to a game show. Amen. Get in there. I can't turn that down. Now, why are all the ladies sitting on one side and the guys sitting on another? I knew this church had issues, amen. All right, where are we at? 20s, where's my 20-year-olds in the room? Oh, yeah, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. No, 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 no. How old are you, Kelby Mosier? All right, come on down. Chase is my helper, so he can't play today. All right, where's my teenagers? I know you've been waiting to get in on this. All right, all right. How about we pick two teenagers? Two teenagers. Guys, sit down. All the girls. Come on, Lindley. I see that hand. Run on up here, Lindley. Come on, Zach. I got you. I got you, Zach. And since today's family day, come on, Zach. Where you at? Where's Zach? Where's Lindley? My word. Like a flash of lightning. All right, give it up for Lindley. Y'all see the excitement on her face today. Someone else was raising her hand. All right, today's family day, so I know I got some kids in the room today. And you know what? When I asked for 70-year-olds, you were the first hand up. I think you thought I said seven. I don't even know how old you are, but come on down. You can play for What other kids? Where are my kids today? Okay, where are my kids today? Come on. Come on. I got room for, come on, come on, come on, come on in. All right, that's it. That's it. That's it. Here's your chair. Here's your chair, sit down. And I'll tell you what, when y'all stand up, we're gonna just remove one of them chairs. Everybody knows how musical chairs works, right? Everybody knows how it works. Now we're gonna just do the 10, I'll remove one chair right away, okay? Everybody stand up, give us some music, and I'll let the sound booth do the job. You guys. Okay, I told you it could get violent. Aaron, you lost to a girl that didn't even want to play. All right, let's do it again. Oh, everybody give it up for Brother Joe, our senior. Didn't y'all love how Pastor Dennis literally just pushed him out of the chair with his hip? Like, get, get. All right, hit it, maestro. I think Lindley's in the chair. She's, She's in the chair, all right? Six chairs, seven people. Oh! Now, I want everybody to look at this. We got all the young ones against Pastor Dennis. How many of you are rooting for Pastor Dennis? Come on, hit it, maestro. Oh, 
good try. All right. Let's hit it. Oh. Pastor Dennis is still in it. He's in it to win it. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. According to the First Lady, Kelby has both cheeks on his chair. Dennis has one. So, sorry, Pastor Dennis. I think you're out on that one. You do have the best, best view, Crystal, so. All right, we're down to two chairs and three people. Let's not hurt each other. Oh, Kelby's out of there. Down to two teenagers, one chair. I need a referee. Hold it. Stop. Stop. Come here, Lindley. Hey, bring me them gift cards. I'm going to give you a participant award. Second place is the first loser, but there's a $10 gift card to Chick-fil-A. How about it for Zach, our winner? Where's my other players? Come up and get you a gift card if you played. Everybody wins when you play musical chairs. Amen. You can't go there today because they're closed on Sundays. Closed on Sundays. Uh-oh. Oh. Paula, you got me again. I thought three people's coming and two's in my hand. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning. I want you to take out a piece of paper and write some notes because this morning I'm going to deal with two things from God's Word. I want to deal with two things I want to deal with this morning from God's Word using musical chairs as our illustration. And I want you to write both of these things down. This is what we're going to look at together this morning from God's Word. Write these down somewhere on a piece of paper, somewhere. Put them in the notes of your phone and don't forget them. Two things I want to deal with this morning from God's Word. And as I preach this morning, I want you to just keep remembering this violent, intense game of church members that were not putting one another before themselves just remember what you've seen. The greatest illustration of all just was played right before you. Are you ready to write these down? Number one, the church is meant to be a place where outsiders become insiders. Write fast because number two is coming. Number two, the church is meant to be a place where we consider others better than ourselves. Let me say both of them to you again so you can get them down. Number one, the church is meant to be a place where outsiders become insiders. And everybody said amen if you're in agreement with that. Number two, the church is meant to be a place where we consider others better than ourselves. Father God, I thank you for how rich your presence has been this morning. And I pray, God, that you would continue to pour out your spirit as the word is being preached. God, I thank you for this word that you placed upon my heart a few weeks ago. And I believe, God, that it is for such a time as right now. So as always, we ask you, speak to our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. The church is meant to be a place where outsiders become insiders. You know, in the game of musical chairs, as was just demonstrated before us here this morning, once the music stops, everyone races for a chair. And the person without a chair is out. That is 
the purpose of the game in one sentence. Music plays, music stops, you race for a chair, and he or she who's without a chair is out. I often wonder how many people walk into, I'm not going to say our church, I'm going to say our churches, the church, how many people on any given Sunday walk into a church, ours included, and, and, and let me even add to that, not only people who might walk in as a visitor, they've never attended there, they, they've never been there, they don't know really anything about the church, don't even know where the sanctuary is when they pull into the parking lot, they know nothing about the preaching, the worship, it's their very first time and adding to that group of people is, 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 is people who are sitting in the church as regular attendees, regular attenders. They're, they're here almost every Sunday. Maybe they've been coming for a few months or maybe even a year or longer, but whatever the case, they're regular attendees. The question I'm getting to this morning is I wonder how many people walk into a church or how many even regular attenders feel like that they are an outsider. They feel like where they've come that they just don't fit in. They feel like just everybody it, it seems to be getting along and everybody has friends and but 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 maybe they just don't feel like they fit. How many of you know you can feel that way even after going to a church for several months? You can feel like an outsider. I, I don't know about you, but I've had some very bad church experiences. And again, I'm not preaching on this this morning because Tag Church is not a friendly church. Matter of fact, if you want to know how friendly Tag Church is, come to a Discover Tag luncheon when we go around the room and we ask all the new members, what is it you love about Tag Church? There are two things that we hear in every Discover Tag luncheon and almost, uh, usually these two things are said by almost everybody in the room. Here's the two things. One, they love the presence of God that they encounter when they come to Tag Church. How many of you love the presence of God at Tag Church? But the second thing we hear over and over again is that Tag Church is a friendly church. We've even had people tell us they got scared when they first came because people wouldn't leave them alone. It was just almost creepy, like, you know, just on top of them. And, and, uh, and that's Tag Church. Whether you you've had that experience or not, that seems to be the experience for most that walk through our doors. But even as friendly as Tag Church is, it, you can still feel like an outsider when you come in and when you're trying to find a new church. I've had so many bad church experiences. It is so awkward to me when you go visit a church and nobody comes up and shakes your hand or nobody comes up and says, we're glad you're here or nobody comes up to get to know you. We've been at churches before where we've sat there literally all the way until church time and we watched people visit over here and we watched people visit over there and we watched pastors come off the platform, walk right by us, go back to the platform. We've watched all the people come by, pass and go, but no one stop and say hello. Has anybody had a church experience like that? Now how many of you know if you're looking for a church that that's probably not the one you're going to come back to. That's probably not the one you're going to feel like an insider in because for whatever reason, everyone there has made you feel like an outsider, like you don't belong, like you don't fit. Now, I get it this morning. Follow me, church. I get it. You can, you can, you can attend the friendliest church in the world and still feel like an outsider because you have a part to play too. I want you to turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have a part to play too. Matter of fact, Proverbs, yeah, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says, uh, it says that a man who has friends must make himself friendly. A lot of you know that scripture. A man who has friends must make himself friendly. If you don't have friends, it could be because you're not very friendly. You may say, well, it's because I'm shy or this or that, but I'm going to tell you, it, 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 it's not hard to, 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 to be a friendly person, to smile, to say hello, to greet people when they walk by you. So Proverbs was saying, a man who has friends has made himself friendly. So yes, we have a part to play. We can't just come to 
to church and, and, and not be friendly and never get connected and come in five minutes late and leave before the service is over and we never come to anything where we can meet people or get connected. We just sit here when nobody is talking to us and then we leave and we get out of here or maybe you're watching on live stream and that's your excuse. You know, you're just sitting at home. Whatever it is today, we've got to make ourselves friendly if we're going to have friends. But hear me this morning. I One thing that I, I love seeing at Tag Church, and I'm seeing it right now, uh, uh, and I, I'm seeing it through social media. I'm hearing about it. I'm, I'm finding out about this happening. And, and, and that is this. I love seeing organic relationships form and grow. Everybody say organic. Organic. That means natural. It's not forced. You know, we have many things in place to help grow relationships. We have age-specific ministries where you can get connected to people in your age group. We got gender-specific ministries where you can get connected to people, men with men, women with women, so on and so forth. But sometimes it's as if those are just programs and they're a date on the calendar, if you will. I love seeing organic relationships. I'm talking about relationships when nobody put it on a church calendar. Nobody said, hey, on Friday night at 7 o'clock we're having this event. I'm talking about just people in the church crossing the aisle, getting to know other people, going to dinner with them, having them over uh, to their house, uh, 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 doing things together that you enjoy doing, whatever that may be, playing board games or, or watching, a, watching sports or going shopping or, or just whatever it may be. I love seeing organic relationships form and grow in the body of Christ. And, and, and by saying that, I believe that it is good for church members to be close. But hear me today, a close church can become a closed church. As good as these relationships and these groups are that form within the body of Christ, as pleasant as it is and as good as it is for brothers and sisters to come together in unity, if we're not careful, we'll come together and we'll form little groups which will turn in possibly to little cliques. And we may have a lot of different organic groups in the church, but when the outsider walks in or the new family walks in and they're trying to get in and they're trying to say, hey, I want to get into this group, but nobody from that group ever asked me to go to lunch after church or I want to get in with these people. I'd like some fellowship with this group, but nobody's ever taken time to really get to know me. What happens is the church begins to play this game of musical chairs where somebody's going to feel like an outsider. Come on, somebody, you got to help me preach today. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 because in the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, we find out that the church of Corinth had issues. Everybody say issues. I mean, it doesn't take Paul but a few verses. Paul starts off nice. The first nine verses, he's real nice. He gives a nice little greeting to them in the first nine verses. But when he hits verse 10, he immediately begins to rebuke them for something that's not going right in the church. And we read this all through his letter through the book of 1 Corinthians as Paul is dealing with things that aren't right in the church. He's, he's, he, 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 he's telling us in the very beginning of the book that the church Church of Corinth had issues. Can I tell you something about a church having issues? Everybody listen loud and clear, or as I say it loud and clear, listen up, because, uh, because if you don't get this, it's going to cause you church hurt, it's going to cause church splits, it's going to cause you to be a church hopper, it's going to cause you to never settle and get planted. So get this if you don't get anything else, and that is this, every church has issues. I'm going to say it for the back row now. Every church has issues. Amen. Every church. There is no such thing as a perfect church. I often tell people, if you find a perfect church, please don't join it. Because it will no longer be perfect. What I know about the church is the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, is perfect. But his body, us members, we are some messed up people. I said we're some messed up people. You will not find a perfect church. 
There will be things about every church you will love and there'll be some things about every church that you won't care for. And this is the American uh, 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 culture, the American mindset where we shop for churches like, like, we, like we shop for our clothes. We go to church and we see what's on the menu for us. What we don't realize is we're supposed to come to church to be the servers. We're supposed to come to church to be the waiters and the waitresses and the workers. We're supposed to come here to be the workers in the kingdom of God. But instead we look at churches and we go, oh, they've got good worship, check. That's something I'm looking for. The preaching's pretty good, check. That's okay, I'm looking for that. Yeah, uh, they got a great kids ministry, check. But they don't have this, they don't have that. So, you know, well, and, and we weigh it. We weigh it like, well, you know, if it had this, then it would be a little bit better. Can I tell you today, friend, you will not find a perfect church, but what we can all do is plug into a church and be the very best member that God has called us to be, and together we will always be better. Together we'll always be better. So Paul tells us in this opening letter to his, this letter to the church at Corinth, he says, listen, the church in Corinth has some issues. And I don't have time to preach the whole book this morning, but, 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 but some of the issues, they have claims of spiritual superiority over one another. This is probably the church at Corinth's biggest issue, you know. They're just who's who kind of battle, you know, who's more important, if you will. Uh, they, they also have this big issue around the communion supper, you know, the, the Lord's Supper. I mean, he really addresses that later on in the book when he talks about, man, when you guys show up for the Lord's Supper, it's not even the Lord's Supper you're partaking in. You, 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 you got issues is what he's telling them. Uh, but, but you know, right here in chapter one, Paul comes out of the gate with what I believe was the biggest issue in the Corinthian church. Look at it with me in verse number 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you but that you be unified in the same mind and the same judgment. So in this opening chapter of this letter to the Corinthians, he uses a strong word. You see it on the screen. He says, I appeal. I appeal. This word means I beg you. Uh, matter of fact, if you read it in the King James Version, it even almost starts out with a rebuke in verse 10. It's almost like the first nine verses, Paul is, is, is saying these positive things. You know, he's getting them ready. You know, that's what we do, right? We, it's called the sandwich effect. You say a lot of nice things, hit them with the meat. Amen. This is your issue. Give them another piece of bread, another little nice thing, sandwich it all together, let them go their way. That's what Paul's doing here. He's saying some nice things about them, the first nine verses. I won't read them. You can look at it. You can skim over it. But then verse 10, he goes into this rebuke. He says, but, but, but wait a minute. I appeal to you. I beg you. Look at it, brothers. Everybody say brothers. We could add sisters to that. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. You know what he's calling them? He's calling them family. I want you to take a minute here and look all the way down your row as far to the walls you can see. That's your family. That's your family. Some funny looking people, aren't they? Come on, take another good look at them. I mean, take a good look at everybody down your row. That's your family. That's your family. Everybody take a look up here. Family. He addresses them as brothers. He's saying we are in the same family. That's what church is, friend. It's a family. Church isn't something you go to. It's somewhere you belong to. I'm going to say that again. It's not somewhere you go. It's something you to belong to. You belong to a family. That's why when you get saved, the first thing you do is you join a church. You plug in to a church because this is your family. We are your brothers and your sisters in Christ. We are our family. Kind of makes me want to sing, we are family. That's what the church is. I don't, I need you to get this before we move on. The church is your family. The church is not your enemy. The church is your family. 
other than your salvation, the best thing that Jesus left you while you remain here on earth is the church. I still believe the church is the best thing going in America. It's the best thing going in the world. It's not perfect. It has its issues. But the church is the best thing there is going. The enemy wants the church to be your enemy. The, the enemy wants the church to be your enemy. He wants you to see the flaws in the church. That's why he wants you to get upset and get mad and get in disagreements. And he wants you to get upset with this and that. And he wants you to leave the church because he doesn't want you to be plugged in to the family of God. Come on, somebody. The enemy wants you to see the church as something that, it, it, that can offend you, that can hurt you, and that when the church offends you or hurts you, you just need to leave. You just need to find you another church. But I've come to tell you today, friend, there's going to be times people are going to hurt you. There's going to be times preachers are going to offend you. There is a such thing as church hurt. But I want you to know there's one who will never hurt you. He will never offend you. And he happens to be the Lord of his church. Well, I ain't going to church with them hypocrites. Y'all don't want to hear what I say to people that tell me that. Oh, you do? Then go to hell with those hypocrites. Don't tell me you don't want to go to church with those hypocrites. You go to work with those hypocrites. You go, to, you go to school with those hypocrites. You go to Olive Garden with those hypocrites. That's just an excuse. Yes, the church will have hypocrites. Yes, the church will have issues. But there is a Lord over the church, and there is perfection in him. So he says in verse 10, after he calls them family, he says that, there be no divisions. Now, that doesn't mean no disagreements because how many of you know you can't even agree with your spouse 100% of the time? I don't know if we could live up to this if it meant no disagreements. It would be a boring world and a weird church if none of us had disagreements. I believe what it means here in the context, and we're going to look deeper into it this morning, no division doesn't necessarily mean no disagreements. It means no clicks. So what is a click? A click is a small group of people who spend time together and who are not friendly to other people. That's a click. Look it up. A small group of people who spend time together who are not friendly to other people. Now, the first half of that definition sounds pretty good. A small group of people that spend time together. Again, that's, that should be something organic in the body of Christ. That should be something very natural. I'm going to tell you, it's very natural to want to be with other people. It's not natural to want to be isolated. Because God created us as relational beings. I only have a few minutes on a Sunday morning. I wish I could really preach what's on my heart today. I would take you back to Genesis and show you just how relational we are. Now I know we're all different. We have different temperaments. You know, I, I can only stand people for so long. My wife can stand them forever. I appreciate the amen because some of them are looking at me like, <laughs> amen. We're all different, you know. But, but, but the issue here in 1 Corinthians 10 when he says no divisions, he's talking about a click. And again, the definition, the first part sounds pretty good, but the last part is where we have an issue, that definition, where it says who, people who are not friendly to other people. Again, there's nothing wrong with gravitating towards people like you or people even that you like, but there is something wrong when we become so closed as a group that we don't recognize the outsider that's trying to get in. It's, it, it becomes an issue when we become so cliquish that we don't realize there's somebody standing that doesn't have a chair. 
There's somebody here this morning, maybe for their first time, or maybe maybe they've been coming for even months, who feel like while the game called church is going and the music is playing and everybody's laughing and having a good time, they don't have a chair. And I'm not talking about the physical chairs that you're sitting in this morning because there's some empty chairs in the room today. There's room for more. I'm talking. I'm, I'm not talking about the physical, literal chair. You're talking. You're, you're sitting in this morning. What I'm preaching about is when somebody wants to feel like they belong and they're looking for a place to come and be a part of. It's our job to make sure that we hear the appeal of God's word and that there not be divisions in such a way that there's no room for other people. That's a click. Look at the next verse, verse 11. I'm going to read it from the King James Version this morning. He says, for it has been declared unto me of you. In other words, he's saying, I've, I've heard something about you. Somebody has told me about First Assembly of God at Corinth. And this is what I'm writing about. It's been declared unto me about you. Look what he says. He says, my brethren, again, addressing them as his family, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. The King James Version uses the word contentions. He says, I'm getting wind, I'm hearing that in your church, Corinthians, there are some contentions among you. That word contention is a Greek word. It's the Greek word eris, eris, E-R-I-S, and it means this. It means a hot dispute or an emotional disagreement. We're not talking about just disagreeing over, you know, do you like Mexican food or do you like Italian food? We're talking about a hot dispute. And so he's saying in the next verse, he's saying, I'm hearing about there being some hot disputes, there being some contentions among you. Now, something just poked me or bit me. I'm sorry. Looks like spider bite too. It's two, two little dots right there together. Ooh, that Bible, it's powerful, amen. Ooh. Sorry for the interruption, but I just got poked, amen. If I pass out here in a minute, call 911. I do this to Crystal all the time. I say, listen, if you find me dead, it's because I had a heart attack because I'm having chest pains right now. She's like, no, you're not. That's called gas. Keep going. One of these days, I'm going to have a heart attack and die on her. He died of gas. Now, I don't know what they disagreed over here in this part because as you keep reading through the book of 1 Corinthians, you're going to find out that Paul, this is not his last, first and last time to deal with this issue of disputes and and them not getting along and all this and being in cliques. He's going to deal with this a few other times through this letter. So uh, later on in the book, it's very clear that it wasn't a dispute over doctrine, that it was actually a dispute over their their social status, you know, okay? Some were rich, some were poor, and Paul's like, come on, this is not right in the church of our God. So I don't know right here. It could be a social status thing. It could be a doctrinal thing. They may be disputing over doctrine. I don't know what it is. I know in the modern church today, we would have disputes. We can have hot, hot issues, hot, hot disputes, if you will, contentions, emotional disagreements over things that really don't even matter. Churches have split over the silliest things. Worship style, color of the carpet, all these things that, 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 that shouldn't divide us, but in the modern church they seem to. But look at the next verse, verse 12. He says, what I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Then he asked them a very important question. He asked them this, is Christ divided? Have we divided Christ in the church because of our cliques? Have we divided Christ in the church because of our preferences and our desires and our style preferences? And and I follow this preacher and I follow that preacher. Have we divided Christ? I'm glad that Tag Church is a friendly church. And again, I'm not preaching this this morning today because we aren't a friendly church. Time out. Some of you aren't friendly, but you're in the minority. Don't look at your neighbor. 
We are a friendly church. That doesn't mean everybody's friendly. But you are in the minority if you're an unfriendly person. You know, a lot of times unfriendly people are just unpleasant people. They're just mad at everything. They're just upset with everything. Critical spirits. Amen. we got to guard against that, don't we, church? We've got to guard against that. It will cost you of the anointing and God's favor on your life. So he says this question, he asks this question, is Christ divided? I'm preaching this this morning not because we're divided or not because we're not a friendly church. I'm preaching it because I know that one thing that the devil would love to do, one thing that the devil would do to destroy Tag Church is to get enough of us playing musical chairs and in, to return destroying the work of God that's happening here. D.L. Moody said, I have never yet known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. I'm also preaching this this morning because I don't know if you recognize this, but Tag Church is growing. How many of you here know everybody at Tag Church? You know their name, you know, you know, you know them. You're no, none of us. Look at that. You're not alone. None of us. How many of you look around sometimes and go, who are these people? I've had some of you tell me, you've told me before, you've said, I went up to introduce myself to somebody and they told me they've been coming here for six months. I felt like an idiot. It's a growing church and that's why we're preaching this. But I believe the church is meant to be a place where outsiders become insiders. I want you to turn with me in this same book to chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at verse number 14 with me this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's going to begin writing about how the church is one body, but this one body has many members or many parts. And look what he says. He says in verse 14, For the body does not consist of one member but many The body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Look at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Look at verse 27. Now you are part of the body of Christ, and you are individually members of it. Paul is saying that this body, the church, has many parts and every part is important and every part is needed and even, even parts that you may look at that, that, that aren't as significant as, as other parts because uh, that's what we do as humans. We, we, we size people up. We judge people. They don't look like us. Uh, they, they're not of the same social class. Uh, class. They don't have the same color of skin or, or, or they don't make as much money as we think they should make and, and we don't sometimes we don't value them as as part of this body but I want you to know what Paul is saying is from the from the the the, the most important part to the least part from the head all the way down to the ingrown toenail bless God you may be feeling that way this morning everybody is part of the body of Christ and we need each other 
So before we move to point two, I want to give you four practical ways that we can help people not feel like an outsider at Tag Church. Write these down, very practical. Four things, four practical ways we can help people not feel like an outsider at Tag Church. Number one, write these down. Number one, don't always sit by the same people at church. Oh, I struck a nerve, hallelujah. I felt that self-righteous spirit rise up in this room almost like I did at Tim Hawkins last night, amen. Our whole group was Pentecostal, raising their hands, worshiping. The people in front of us were Church of Christ. <laughs> and if you down on that row knew the looks they were giving you guys, because we sat right behind them, watched them look at you. Found it funny that they laughed at the jokes, but they mocked worship. I just sat behind them the whole time. <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> Thought about it, but I didn't. Now, I know this doesn't sound very deep and very theological when I say this morning, don't always sit by the same people at church. But don't come griping to me that you don't know anybody in church. Don't come tell me about how you don't know anybody. If you ain't done anything to get out of your little circle and meet somebody you've never met before. So here's what we're going to do, and it's going to take a lot of work this morning. Instead of having 10 volunteers play musical chairs, we're going to play uh, congregational musical chairs this morning. And I know you're going to have to close your Bible, pick up your pads and your, and your, and your blankets and your, and your bags. I don't, y'all, some of y'all bring suitcases to church. I don't even get it. Y'all come in, you got like carry-on bags back there. I'm like, what are y'all? I'm, I'm the pastor. I walked in with a Bible and a cell phone. Y'all carrying bags in, you know. Some people got comforters. I got people, I had one Sunday, somebody plug in an electric blanket over on a side outlet over there. I mean, they're going to be running extension cords. You got some people with electric blankets. Some's going to set up a fan. You're going to set up right at that camera. You got an extra plug there, uh, Brother Jared, you got a plug there? I can plug in my fan and get a little warm here on Sunday morning. Bless God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I've given you time to get all your stuff up and get your stuff together. We're going to do something, and you're not going to walk out the back door while I'm preaching. Amen. I will come after you and grab you and get you. You are going to play musical chairs. What that means, you're going to get up. You're going to find somewhere else in this sanctuary that you've never sat before. I want you to literally try to cross the room if you possibly can. But here's the key. Don't go yet. Here's the key. On your way to finding a new chair, I want you to find five people. You don't know their name. You don't know anything about them. Introduce yourself to them. Smile at them. They won't bite you. I promise you it's good people even on the other side of the room. They're really good people. I want you right now to get up and find somewhere else to go. Come on, let's play it. Hit the music, maestro. Find five people on your way. Be friendly. This is beautiful. This is better than a good altar call. This is amazing. Come on, you gotta talk to people. Smile at them. If you're usually on the back row, come find out what a front row feels like. You should have already met at least three people because the music's getting ready to stop. All right, find you a new seat this morning. Find you a new seat this morning. The music has stopped. There is a chair for you. <clears throat> I've seen some powerful altar calls, but this was beautiful. Come on, give it up for yourselves. This was beautiful. Ain't that beautiful? Nobody got attacked. Nobody got shunned. 
You know five people you didn't know when you got here this morning? At least their name, that's a start. And I don't know how I'm going to finish preaching this message with Buster that close to me. I'm looking at all these back row people that have moved up. This is just too weird for me. Now look down your row at all those new people. That's your family. Go ahead and tell your family, I love you, family. I visited a church once. Crystal and I were sitting there. It was in Stratford, Missouri, and somebody literally came up to us and told us we were in their seats. Yeah. We were in their seats. Let me tell you this. The only seats that are reserved in this church are the ones that are reserved for safety team to have a special seat so they can keep us safe. Other than that, you don't own your seat. You don't own your row. Come on, somebody. And I'll tell you, revival would break out at Tag Church if we played musical chairs in a good way like this every week where you find somewhere else to sit or at least if you're going to stay in your same place, find somebody to invite to sit with you. If you see an outsider walk in, I don't know them, I've never recognized them, you ought to be the first person to say, hey, would you like to sit with us? I'm going to tell you today, friend, it's not going to be the preaching that's going to keep them at the church. It's not going to be the worship that's going to keep them there. It's going to be you and me me, extending a friendly hand, bringing people in rather than keeping them out. All right, so pull your blankets back out, get your notepad back out, open your Bible, get comfortable. Come on, I know this, the only thing it would be better if you had a lazy boy, I get that, but we're not doing that. Let me give you the last three real quick. Number one, don't always, don't always sit by the same people at church. Number two, invite someone to sit with you or invite someone sitting by themselves for you to sit with them, especially at events, especially when revival weekends and things, when we have so many visitors. This is when a, a church, we can be practical in bringing people in. Number three, move from the front door to the kitchen table. How many of you know there's some people that's gonna knock on my door that's not coming inside? Jehovah's Witnesses would be one. <laughs> Vacuum salesman would be two. One night, Crystal, this was a couple years ago, Crystal told me, I don't even know where Crystal is anymore. Did you leave Crystal? Okay, she's still here. One night, one, one, one night, Crystal come home from work and she told me, she said, listen, we got a vacuum cleaner salesman coming, gonna be here at six o'clock tonight. I said, I'm leaving. She said, no, we, we both have to be here. It was part of the agreement, and we win this air purifier. I said, I'll buy the air purifier. What's it cost? I don't care what it costs. Buy it. You want an air purifier? I'll buy it. I am not spending my evening with a vacuum clean. Now, if you're a vacuum clean salesman or woman, <laughs> God bless you. So she said, well, we can't call and cancel. I said, well, I'm leaving. And I left, and I tell you, you can only drive around the block so many times praying, God, please, Get this vacuum clean salesman. That little minivan sitting in my driveway every time I come back around. There it is. There it is again. There it is again. I'm texting. Will you tell them to leave? Now, there's some people I don't want to come past my door, but I'm going to tell you, if any one of you in this room came knocking on my door, I'm not going to just stand there at the door keeping you from in my house. I'm going to invite you in. I'm going to say, come in. I'm probably going to ask you, what would you like to drink? And we're going to sit down at the table, and we're going to have a, we're going to have a drink together. We're going, to, we're going to have a glass of water, a cup of coffee, whatever together. Why? Because you're my family. And what we do often in the church is we keep people at the front door. Our relationship is our relationship with other people, this is as deep as it gets. We might ask them their name. We might even know where they work. We might know just a couple things about them, but that's all we ever know about each other. That's a front door relationship. Friend, the relationships that God wants in his body and in his church are the ones where we say, come in. Come into the living room. Come on into the kitchen. Sit down with me. Have a drink. Let's fellowship together. Let's have relationship together. So I'm asking you to move from the front door to the kitchen table in your relationships 
with people in the church. And number four, invite different people to join you for lunch. This is a very practical thing, but I'm going to tell you today, it works because you can only your relationship with other people can only go to a certain level when you're just sitting here singing songs together and saying amen together. But when you get out of here and you go to lunch or you invite someone over for a meal, and I'll tell you what, that's your altar call this morning. That's your altar call. The altar call is not going to be come and let me slap some oil on you. The altar call is to do these practical things. What an altar call that would be if you went to lunch with someone today and got to know someone. Amen? Number two, number two, and let me hit this quick today. The church is meant to be a place where we consider others better than ourselves. I want you to turn now, let's leave the book of Corinthians for just a minute. We're going to close there. We'll come back to it. But go to Philippians chapter 2 with me this morning. Philippians chapter 2. The church is meant to be a place where we consider others better than than ourselves. Look at Philippians 2, verse 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul again, he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Everybody say same mind. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. Say same love. Being in full accord. Say full accord. And of one mind. Say one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Man, that's a good verse right there. If you're looking for a verse to memorize in 2022, there's one right there. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of vain conceit, but rather consider one another above yourselves. Now, when I watch that game of musical chairs play out here in just a minute, a minute ago, Not one person gave up their chair for someone standing. Not one of you. Bunch of heathens. Now, I didn't expect you to. I'm looking for certain people. You see, people ask, why do you always look at me while you're preaching? Because you give me good feedback. If I never look at you, try giving me better feedback. Amen. If you're like, pastor never makes eye contact with me, probably because you look half asleep, bored, maybe even mad at me. But people that are like, I mean, I'll look at you the whole time, you know. Look, look at Amy. She's rolled over. <laughs> She's having a good time. I mean, I will just preach right at you all morning long. So I'm looking for my regular feedbackers out there, and y'all have moved around, and I'm messed up in the head right now. I'm looking for some new feedbackers. I don't know where to look. <laughs> okay. Okay. I see you back there. Joe Hastings, one of, I mean, one of our elders in the church, seniors, one of the first ones to get knocked out of his chair. None of you, none of you kids said, respect your elders. You can have my chair. Not a one of you. And you didn't even know you was playing for a gift card. You are just playing for fun. Not one of you. Not one of you men allowed that woman to take your chair. Not a one of, heathens, y'all know I'm having fun, I'm playing with you. Not one of you said, no, no, you knocked her, I mean, Zach got in a fight with Lindley. I mean, I thought I was going to come down there and get in the middle of it. (laughs) Not one person gave up their chair for someone left standing in musical chairs. Not one child gave it up for one of our elders. I wonder if that's what Christ sees when he sees his church. I know that's what Paul was seeing when he wrote this letter of Corinthians. It's not natural to put others before ourselves as verse 3 of Philippians 2 is telling us to do. It's not a natural thing, but hear me, it's a spiritual thing. Just because it's not natural doesn't mean it's not spiritual. The church is meant to be a place where we consider others above ourselves. Now I want you to turn over to the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. And I've run out of time to really preach these, but I still want to read them. I want to read you right now two parables of Jesus called the parable of the wedding feast and the parable of the great banquet. Look at it with me beginning in verse number 7 of Luke's Gospel chapter 14. 
Now remember, a parable is a story, an earthly story making a spiritual kingdom point, okay? But just because he's telling a parable doesn't mean he wasn't actually at the event he's talking about. Matter of fact, most of his parables came out of what was around him. He would see something, and he would use it as a teaching illustration. He would point out at something. So it's pretty clear to us here that Jesus and his disciples, they've been invited to some wedding banquet. And they're at this wedding banquet, and Jesus is just kind of standing back watching everybody do their thing at this banquet, at this meal. And that's where the parable begins. He literally looks at him. He says, guys, I want you to see these people. And look what he says in verse 7. It says, now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to the person And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place, verse 10. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you see that in verse number 11? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So this first parable at the wedding feast is this parable where he's noticing how people were going and they were looking for where they were going to sit at the feast, at the banquet, and and what seat they chose to sit in. And and, and I can almost imagine him looking over his shoulder as a disciple saying, "Look look at her, look at him. Look, they just walked up right up to the front. Like, you know, I mean, just walked right up there into probably one of the guest of honor seats. And they just sat down. And he goes on to teach this by saying, you know, it'd be better for you to just kind of sit in the back, sit in a lowly spot, uh, rather than the, the, the host coming up and saying, excuse me, but that seat uh, isn't for you. That's actually for the family or that's for this person or that person. So we're going to need to move you. How humiliating that would be to move you to a different seat. But how honoring it would be if you take a lowly seat and he comes to you, the host, and he says, hey, we want you to come and sit up here. We have an extra seat up in the front. We want to move you to the how honored you would feel. The whole point is this. Put others before yourselves. Consider others more important or more significant. Paul said in Philippians, more significant than you consider yourself. But look how he goes right on in to this second parable in verse number 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor. The crippled, the lame, the blind. How many of you know that's referencing sinners there? That's referencing the lost there. He's saying when you're going to have church, when you're going to have a meeting, when you're going to come together, don't just invite each other. You know, I wonder when he looks down on us in revival weekends and he sees us inviting people from other churches and, and, other, and, and, other, and, other, and other believers, but he never sees us inviting the lost. This is what this parable is all about, friend. This is what he's saying. He said, he said when you invite them, invite the poor, invite the blind, invite the lame, invite the, uh, the crippled, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Verse 15, when one of those who reclined at the table with them heard these things, he said to them, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. Here's the parable. And at that time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. It must be Sunday morning. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Please have me excused, verse 19. And another said, Pastor, I have a migraine. Amen. Well, come and get healed. We'll rub you with oil and pray for you. Praise God. I, oh, no, that's not what it says. It says, I bought five yoke of oxen. I want to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife. Okay, amen. Therefore, I cannot come. So the servant came and reported those things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. 
And he said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. And the servant said, sir, we've commanded you. We've done what you've commanded us, and still there's, no, there's still room. And the master said to the servant, then go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come that my house may be filled. For I tell you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Aren't you thankful this morning that that is exactly what Jesus did? Jesus associated with sinners, friends. He ate with tax collectors. He was a friend of sinners. He associated with prostitutes and tax collectors and and fishermen. Fishermen were the blue-collar workers. They stank and, and they were usually poor. These are the people he associated with. Tax collectors were embezzlers and, and, uh, and they, 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 they cooperated with the Romans. These were, these were people that nobody wanted as a friend. But Jesus, he continued to transcend culture, not only by reaching out to those that no one else would reach out to, but one of my favorite stories is when he transcended culture by, uh, by, by, by having a conversation when he conversed with the Samaritan woman at the well. Even that conversation conversation made the disciples go, this is strange, this is different, this is weird. It surprised even the disciples. But what we know about our Jesus is he touched lepers, hallelujah. What we know about Jesus is out of everyone in the crowd, he said, Zacchaeus, we're going to go to your house today and we're going to have lunch at your house. I'm telling you today, uh, this is our Jesus. He didn't require people to change before they came to him. That's what the Pharisees did. He said, come just as you are. I want I want to eat with you. I want to sit with you. I want to dine with you. He demonstrated this parable by going to the cross and saying all can come. All the blind, all the lame, all the lost, all the dirty, all the sinful. You're welcome to come. And in the book of James chapter 2, we won't turn there and read there this morning, but we're instructed to be careful that we not Look at people that come in wealthy and that have rings and and robes and, and we honor them above the poor. I preached a message a couple years ago. What did I call that? Stuck up in the sanctuary. Thank you, Jay. I knew Jay Jay remembers more of what I preached than I remember what I preached. Thank you. Stuck up in the sanctuary. And I preached on that James passage. But I want to close this morning by going back to Corinthians. And Pastor Josh, if, if you want to come this morning and, and get ready. <clears throat> when I read these parables, I'm reminded that that is exactly what Jesus did. And how many of you know Jesus is our greatest example? told you to turn to Corinthians, but there's a few verses there in Philippians chapter 2. And I put this portion of scripture to memorization a long time ago. And it's really helped me look through the eyes of Jesus, especially when it comes to making room for people and putting others before ourselves. And that's in Philippians 2 verse 5 where he says, let this mind be in you or let this attitude be be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the same attitude, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who considered himself nothing. Christ became nothing. He took on the form of a servant. He was found in the appearance of a man, Paul said. He became nothing. Why? To put you and me before himself. Who being in the very nature of God, considered himself equality with God, nothing that could even be grasped. That was his attitude. That was his mind. But he emptied himself. Took on that nature of a man. And then God exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because God exalts those who humble themselves and he opposes the proud. I gave you a few practical ways a moment ago how we as a church can help outsiders 
become insiders. Let me give you a few practical ways here. Or maybe I should call them attitudes that we need to have so that we consider others better than ourselves. The first one, number one, write these down real quick. Be compassionate. Be compassionate. I remember a few months ago in staff meeting, we were, I don't know if we were doing a book together or what, why we were on this topic, but I remember a question being posed, uh, being raised, being asked as a staff of what we loved the most about Jesus. And we've paralleled that to what the people in the Bible, in the Gospels, must have loved the most about Jesus. You know, it's not his power that I love the most about. Because how many of you know there's been a lot of powerful men with no compassion and they become dictators? Hitler was a powerful man but no compassion. So we begin to look at this through God's word and we begin to realize that what we all, I think, love the most about Jesus is his compassion. A very practical way or an attitude that we can have in considering others better than ourselves is by being compassionate. Jesus said, everyone will know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. The second thing, which is close to the first one that we can do, the second attitude is to be empathetic. Be empathetic. What does that mean? It means put yourself in their shoes. Empathy. Consider their needs. Jesus taught us the golden rule. Whatever you wish others would do to you, do to them. In other words, how would you like other people to treat you? Treat them the same way. And number three, develop a servant's heart. talking about putting others before ourselves. I'm talking about the church should be a place where we come to serve others. You know, just because you're, you may be in the customer service business and just because you're in the customer service business doesn't mean that you're serving others. Has anyone ever had bad customer service? Has anybody ever had their sanctification tested? <clears throat> Waiting online? With somebody that does, you can't understand them, they can't understand you? And they don't want to help resolve your issue? They don't care? Have you ever had it where you know they're reading the script off the computer? Why is it they always, you know, computer went down. Give me a few minutes. But it never goes down when they have to say, well, I saw that you experienced this, whatever it was. They read the script, and you're like, stop reading the script. I want to talk to somebody who cares. We've all had bad customer service. But just because you're in customer service doesn't mean that you're in the business of serving others. Because Serving starts with the right attitude. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen? So in the kingdom of God and in the church, we need people at Tag Church willing to serve, but not just to serve, but to serve with the right attitude. And I can tell you, if you're ready to sign up, we need volunteers today. I don't know where Rachel went to. There you are. Switch the size of it. But she needs volunteers in nurseries, especially Wednesday nights and revival weekends. I'm telling you, there are places to serve in every ministry in this church. But it starts with the right attitude. It starts with the right attitude. I want you this morning to look back at 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to read this last passage and then we're going to, we're going to pray and have communion together. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. The 
The church is meant to be a place where outsiders become insiders. The church is meant to be a place where we consider others better than ourselves. Look at it with me, verse number 17. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture. We often read at communion, but many times we don't read it in the context. And if you've never really looked at it in the context, you're going to realize, oh my word, what was going on in this church? He says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is for the better. It is not for the better, but for the worse. Now, that's not, that's not good news. When you come to have church, it ain't good. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. There it is again. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Wow. When you do come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. Told you they had issues. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So he gives us the issues. And the issues are very clear. They're not waiting on each other. They're, it's, a, it's a selfish mentality. They're eating when others didn't have food. They're putting themselves first. And they, they've turned the church into a circus. So then he gives these instructions when he says, For I received, in verse 23, from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's usually the one paragraph we read. But he wasn't done talking. Look at verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Don't miss verse 33. So then, my brothers, family again, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let them eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I'll give directions when I come. Let's stand together this morning. I'm going to ask if the ushers that are assisting us with serving communion. Today's altar call is very simple. We're going to examine ourselves. We're going to examine ourselves. That's what he said to do here. Examine yourselves. We're going to put others before ourselves. We're going to be intentional about bringing people from the front door, bringing them in. Ushers, if you will, Steve, if, Jay, if you want to get these emblems and let's serve the people this morning. And as you're being served today, Crystal, if you will lead us in worship. And as she leads us in worship and as we're waiting on the emblems today, would you just take a moment in reflection of what we've seen in musical chairs and what we heard from God's Word this morning? This message today was packed with Scripture. I, I mean, we read verse after verse today. So we have enough today to be able to examine ourselves and say, Lord, search me. Search my mind, my attitude today. And if there's been any way where we've We've shunned people or we've, we've formed cliques and we've not let outsiders in. God, forgive us of that today. Give us, forgive us of that today. Everyone's welcome if you're a born-again believer to partake of communion, to receive the emblems today. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, 
You can do so by clicking right here. And also, here is another message that will bless you. Just click right here. Thank you, and we pray that we will see you again here at Tag Church. God bless you.